Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Paul, NL0T, <clears throat> at the Front Range Six Meter Group and the Deep Space Exploration Society. Ta da! And uh, today we have uh, Bill Miller, who's going to be giving us a presentation. He's the Vice President of the Deep Space Exploration Society, and he's going to tell us all about deep space and uh, how we use the uh, site we have down in uh, Haswell, Colorado. So with that, Bill, would you uh, please uh, go ahead and share your uh, presentation? Okay. Here we go. Um, all right, this is a uh, nice shot of uh, the Milky Way and some of the surrounding small towns that are 40 miles away, these uh, sky glows that you see. And this was taken during the Perseid meteor shower. And the guy just happened in one frame, in one shot, in the 30-second exposure, caught two meteors right above the dish. So I thought that was kind of cool. So what are we doing down there in Haswell? Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ray Ubrecken, Gary Agernot, Myron Babcock, Dr. Dr. Richard Russell, Bob Haggart, Dan Lane, Paul Sobin, and others for providing all the information that's in this presentation. Uh, we've been doing this for, I've been in the group for about nine years, and um, this is probably about the fifth iteration of this. I, I take this as an open house presentation. We are having an actual open house on October 5th, so if you can all come down and uh, visit us in person, that would be great. This is kind of the information that uh, you uh, might miss if you didn't come to the open house, but uh, also some information that you'll you wouldn't get even if you did come to the open house. So this is the technical part. So the DSES, the Deep Space Exploration Society, we own and operate a 60-foot radio telescope dish near Haswell, Colorado. It's about five miles south of the small town of Haswell. Haswell has less than 100 people. And if you remember the name Haswell, Haswell was the name of the Intel processor back about 10 years ago that was the premier Intel processor. And they took that from the name, the Haswell name of the Colorado town. As you can see, there's my uh, my Durango parked in the shadow of the dish. Gives you some idea of the magnitude of this dish. It's 60 feet across and it's about uh, 65 feet tall to the apex when it's in this bird bath position. Also shown in this picture is our current uh, communications trailer or operation trailer with the solar panels on top. And that's our new building background. We'll get into that a little bit more. So the Deep Space Exploration Society is a Colorado-based nonprofit 501c3 organization. It's dedicated to radio astronomy uh, and the advocacy of, of space exploration and radio education for students, the general public, and for the society and group members. Uh, we strive to continuously update and improve our facility, radio astronomy, and amateur radio capabilities to benefit the society members and the public education. Give you a little bit of history about the uh, the dish itself. The goal of the original research that the dish was built for was to compile a standard communication handbook of accurate reference material so that any a group that desired uh, to establish a long distance communication system would have all the data necessary for the site selection and the construction of the system. The study of the sites lasted from about 1958 uh, to 1974. So what that means is the government built this as a research facility. It wasn't really intended for any true uh, active communication mission other than for the research to figure out how to do it. The information gained from that uh, communication study and research was uh, used in the distant early warning radar system or the dew line. And if you look if you look up White Alice, that was the system that was actually installed on the dew line for the communications between sites on the dew line in this and from those sites down all the way to Colorado to NORAD. The Haswell site construction was underway in about 1957. Part of the land was leased, and then it was expanded and purchased by the government in 1963 through eminent domain. Uh, the Haswell site was operated until 1974 when it was made obsolete by satellites and fiber optics 
and then it was abandoned by the government and surplused and put up on government auction. This is what the site looked like in 1972. There was a 500 foot radio tower with an with an elevator inside of it, and that was used for VHF uh, propagation studies to just to uh, figure out how far television stations could be placed uh, from each other on the same channel. And this is back in the days of analog television, uh, but that was one of the uh, one of the research projects that they undertook at the site. And then there you can see the dish and big uh, towers for the uh, three-phase power that came in. There was a uh, three-phase 900-amp service that came into the site to run amplifiers and such. And all of that was uh, taken out and no longer available. So the site was made for tropospheric scatter. So uh, because microwave is a good medium for high-speed data, that's what they wanted to use, but microwave doesn't move around the curvature of the Earth. So to get around that, they use tropospheric scatter. And what that does is uh, you have over here, like at, T, at the T1 position, you have a dish. You uh, push that uh, energy off into the horizon, light up a volume of atmosphere at the horizon about 30 miles away. And then you have another dish looking back at that same volume and you can receive that signal as the, um, the radio bounces off of the atmospheric particles and the and the uh, atmospheric uh, moisture, and by doing that over and over again, each one of these stations could be placed, you know, three to six hundred miles apart, and they could still communicate. And if they set up a, a system, a relay system all the way around, they could get all the way to Alaska with that kind of a of a uh, tropospheric scatter communication system. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the DSES. So DSES, they were originally formed in 1991 in Boulder County. The members started restoring two identical dishes to the dish that we that we own uh, that were placed on uh, the T21 or T22 site up North Table Mountain, about 10 miles north of Boulder. Uh, there was considerable success with that facility. They, they used the talents of the professionals, university students, to refurbish those dishes and get those dishes running. Unfortunately, Table Mountain is a secure government site. And uh, sometime after 9-11, uh, more conservative management closed the site for amateur use and the DSES needed to find a new home. So that brings us to the Haswell site history. The Haswell site lay dormant from 1974 when the government abandoned it until 2009, and it fell prey to the elements, vandalism, and theft of most of the infrastructure copper. Um, uh, so the original large three-phase overhead power lines were removed to facilitate farming around the site. And sometime during that period, from 1974 to 2009, we're not quite sure when, a gentleman named Paul Plishner, who was a prominent radio and microwave engineer and uh, contractor to the government, saw this on government auction, and he purchased it uh, sight unseen. Uh, he probably realized after a period of time, sending some of his people out to inventory the site and take a look at what, what was done, uh, he probably said it was impractical to restore it, and he offered it up for sale for a number of years, but he found no buyers. So uh, what happened was uh, the DSC, DSES group in Boulder and Longmont, they uh, had to leave the Table Mountain site. So they asked Mr. Plishner if they could be the custodians of the Haswell site and do some restoration. And he agreed and provide them with a no-cost lease. And they moved the operation communication trailer and some of their equipment down to Haswell. And they abandoned the two-dish uh, system up on uh, Table Mountain. So since that time, they've been working very hard. We've all been working very hard to restore and modernize the dish. I'll say one other thing. The original Boulder team, uh, they were about four hours away. And so for them to work on the site, they needed to travel the four hours there and back, which made it almost impossible for a single day uh, excursion. So they'd bring campers down and they'd do that. But after a while, most of them actually aged out or burned out doing this. 
And after getting quite a bit of success, they decided to uh, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say they all decided at the same time, but they each kind of fell away from the project. And about 2000, uh, a little after 2009, some of our people here in Colorado Springs started getting reconnected with that group. And so most of the people now are from Colorado Springs, the people that actually work on the site. So um, after a period of time, uh, Michael Lowe, the group president at the time, asked Mr. Plishner if he considered donating the dish to the DSCS organization, and, and Mr. Plishner did. He, uh, he gave, originally gave us a no-cost lease, and then he just gave us the whole, the whole facility. We still have a portion of the facility that belongs, or of the site property, that still belongs to the Plishner family. But for the most part, all of our operations, operational area is owned by the DSES. So for this generous donation, we named this the uh, site the Paul Plishner Radio Astronomy and Space Sciences Center. He passed away in 2016, but his generosity is still greatly appreciated by the organization. His legacy will live on for many years as the site is brought to full operational status as a space science and radio uh, discovery educational center. Let me stop right there. Uh, any questions about the site uh, history? Okay. Um, let me go on to the dish itself. So here's the specifications for the dish. Um, it has a frequency range about 400 megahertz to two gigahertz. But we actually believe that based on the, the geometry of the dish surface and the uh, size of the holes of the mesh in the dish, uh, we, 10 giga, gigahertz is possible. It's 60 foot in diameter, has uh, a gain of uh, 42 and a half dB at 1 gigahertz, and uh, has a beam width of about 0.8 degrees at 1.2 gigahertz. So when we operate at uh, 1296, We've got a beam width of about 0.8 degrees. So if you think about uh, the uh, the aperture of, that you'd need for the moon, I think the moon is about 0.4 degrees in uh, in size. And so most of our energy when we do moon bounce goes right past the moon, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it has a very low noise, noise temperature. It has full hemispherical and tracking control. So we can point in any direction uh, and straight up. Uh, we can't go over the over the uh, the zenith uh, uh, completely, but we can go 10, 10 degrees past zenith. And we have about a 40 degree per minute max slew rate. We never operate at that. Uh, we usually run it a lot slower because the uh, celestial sphere and the moon operate pretty slow. And we don't generally track satellites. so. Uh, we try to run it as slow as possible to minimize the wear. The maximum deviation of the surface from a true parabolic shape of this dish was specified at no greater than a quarter inch at any point in the dish with winds up to 30 miles an hour, and that's with any position of the dish. So uh, they had to build it very strong, and uh, it had to withstand you know, high winds and a lot of bad elements out on the eastern plains. It says when properly stored in the stove position or the bird bath position, it should be capable of withstand winds of 120 miles an hour with a maximum radial ice formation of three inches. So that's a pretty incredible spec, and that tells you how strong this thing really is. Here you can see the infrastructure, uh, all the uh, all the beams and everything. This is most of these tubes in this um, in this superstructure are uh, eight and 10 inch aluminum tubes. It's all Healy arc welded together to government specification. So everything above the collar here that sits on the pedestal is aluminum and everything below that is, um, is steel and the, and the axles of course are steel. But uh, the, for the most part, this is all made out of aluminum and Healy arc welded. There you can see uh, where Ray is working on one of the struts, you can see the uh, holes in the uh, aluminum plate. The aluminum plate is about three sixteenths of an inch in um, in thickness, and the holes are a quarter inch on about one inch centers. 
And you can walk on this surface and it doesn't distort the surface at all. It sat out there in the Eastern Plains for 60 years and has no hail damage. So that brings us to power. When, uh, when the group took over the site in 2009, there was no power. It had all been taken out. So they installed solar panels, batteries, inverters on, on each of the uh, facilities. The, these batteries in the top right-hand corner are yeah, actually in the bunker. There's a bunker on site that has about uh, 1,500 square feet of uh, interior space. And we have the battery in the pump room. There's uh, sump pumps in the pump room. And uh, the batteries are a backup to the sump pumps because when the when we lose power, if we lose solar, you gotta have enough power to keep the keep the uh, system dry. And uh, this this bunker is about uh, 14 feet underground to the floor, and uh, it floods quite often. And uh, without the sump pumps, we uh, would be in in a world of hurt with the equipment. So back in about uh, 2017, the site was trenched and we installed a, uh, a two and a half kilowatt or two, 25 kilowatt uh, propane generator in this uh, in this shed and um, a propane generator sitting on that trailer right there. It takes a forklift to lift it into the shed and they installed that. And uh, that gave us power across the site. Uh, so the site was uh, wired in the trench with uh, three-aught four-strand electrical wire across the entire site. So there was about 650 feet of wire run across the site, and the generator shack was put almost in the center. Then in 2018, uh, Skip Creeley, who's a prominent uh, RF entrepreneur, he had several companies that he sold. He, gener he generously donated the money to bring a single phase power line over a mile into the site and get us hooked up to uh, utility power. And once that was attached, we had enough two, three volt uh, split phase power that we could spend a whole lot less time maintaining the batteries, the solar panels, and the generator, uh, and a lot more time doing a radio experience. So thank you, Skip. We'll see a little bit more on Skip a little bit later in this presentation. Then in uh, 2023, I analyzed the low voltage power distribution running the 1200 feet from the transformer pole at the road that uh, was the system that they put in with uh, Skip's money. And uh, that comes, uh, we were putting in a new building, so that had to come 1200 feet down to the new building into the dish. And I found that to be uh, deficient and had excessive voltage drop. Uh, as it was a low voltage 230 volt system coming down through the site 1200 feet. So if we run anything very big and I wanted to be able to run air conditioning units and heat pumps and motors and all the stuff that takes to run the new building, uh, we couldn't do that with, uh, with the transformer out at the road. So in September of uh, 2023, we contracted the Southeast Power Association uh, to, co to come down and install 650 feet of additional overhead high voltage line and 600 feet of underground high voltage line to a new transformer at the center of the site near the new building. And that will provide a 200 amp, uh, 230 volt split phase service for the building and 100 amp service to the underground bunker and 100 amp service to the uh, comm trailer uh, with the transformer placed in almost the center of all of that. And uh, that'll solve most of the voltage drop problems that we had before. It was amazing. They sent out, uh, I think it was seven guys and seven trucks. <laughs> you see the picture there with a trencher and everything they needed to install that. And they worked three days to install that. And uh, they only charged us, uh, I can't even remember what they charged, it was ridiculously low. But uh, it was a pretty good deal to uh, get good power brought in. So recent site infrastructure upgrades and projects, these are things that are all new since last year. So we have a new steel operations building, uh, the building gutters, drainage, erosion control, restroom and kitchen facilities, uh, PVC conduit runs from the building to the dish and to the Rome towers for our radio uh, towers, uh, 280 gallon uh, or 1,280 gallon 
cistern tank with on-demand uh, uh, water pump, a 500-gallon septic tank and leach field, a new utility power connection with improved distribution loss, a DSL internet connection, and hopefully upgrade to fiber in 2025. The, uh, the company that uh, does the internet down there and the telephone, uh, I think it's uh, Southeast Telephone. Uh, can't remember the name of the company. Anyway, they're talking about uh, putting in fiber to our site in 2025. That'll be a big improvement. And then uh, and we improved the sump pumps and in ground flood control. We got security cameras and new parking areas. Any questions about all of that? Okay. So in 2023, we, uh, or actually 2022, we wrote a grant uh, proposal to the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group to build a new operations building for the site. This proposal was only eight pages, but uh, I guess we, we sold it pretty well and it was accepted and the funds were granted for a new building. Uh, due to post-COVID labor and supply chain shortages, the building didn't get underway until well into 2023 and continued to suffer labor shortages but now we're very close to completion of the building it's a steel uh 1800 square foot building it'll expand our operations for the comfort of the organization students and the general public to have a uh, radio control room a classroom a kitchen a kitchenette really a bathroom and a garage this is the layout of the building and the and a uh, pictorial view of the front uh here you see the uh the radio and dish control room over on the left-hand side of the floor plan, classroom in the middle, the kitchen there in the bathroom. And one of the stipulations would have had it to be an ADA compliant bathroom and actually an ADA compliant facility. And the only problem I've had with that is getting doors with thresholds low enough to actually meet the, the strict ADA requirement. And I think we about got it whipped. And then it has a garage over on the far uh, right-hand side. This is a few pictures of the building being put up. We had a, a group from Clovis, New Mexico, the four guys came up with uh, two big diesel trucks pulling uh, big flatbed trailers. They brought everything they needed. They pulled up. This is uh, after the first half day at sunset. They got there about noon and had this much up by a by sunset on the first day. That's the second day, third day, still the third day, and then it was finished on the third day. So these guys, the four guys put this thing up, didn't miss a screw in three and in actually basically two and a half days and uh, put it all together. But that's just the bare metal building in which kind of looks like this picture here. Um, it did not include the box within a box, which I uh, call the uh, yeah box within a box, which is the bathroom and the kitchen, just the metal structure and the siding. And we had that uh, spray foam insulated on every surface, all the interior walls and exterior walls. And um, then I devised a way of doing the wall paneling. Uh, with minimized framing and minimized uh, materials for cost, and we covered all of that uh, all that spray foam except for the ceiling, which we left and painted white. And that's what the inside of the building looks like now. So that gives you an idea of uh, of where we came from and uh, and how we got there. So we're about ready to move all of our equipment in here. And uh, we've got racks that go into these conduits on the floor. And uh, we've got uh, all the uh, all the material we need to really outfit this and make it a uh, operational center. That's what the outside looks like. And we've got a nice parking area. We've got to put some railroad ties along here so people don't run into the uprights that hold up the uh, the front awning. So that brings us to uh, the radio and the radio astronomy upgrades that we've done with the site. We've uh, got a remotely operated amateur radio station provided by Paul Sobin. Paul generously donated that, and I'll get into that a little bit later here. 
We've got a new, we've got two new Rome 55 tower bases on either side of the building. Uh, we've got a 400 watt EME tra uh, transverter by Alex uh, uh, Nurs. I can't say his last name. Sorry, Paul. You'll have to tell us how to. Nurs Nursian. Nursian, yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, he did a great job on this uh, this 400 watt EME transverter. You'll hear that in a minute. Um, we can do celestial and moon tracking control. Uh, with an upgrade from we did we had 12 bit encoders and now we're up to 16 bit absolute encoders and so we can track down to you know a thousandth of a degree um we got I, ionospheric uh scintillation experiment with the university of texas in dallas uh an experimental inferometer with twin 30 3.8 meter dishes where we've got that in prog progress uh, we've got all the uh, electronics and one of the dishes so far. And we got to pick up the other dish here before winter sets in and get that installed. Uh, and we recently acquired a uh, 30 foot additional dish and a uh, silent uh, key uh, cell. And uh, that'll be erected on the site next year. And so we'll have the 60 foot, the 30 foot, two 3.8 meter dishes all on site ready to go. This is uh, the remote operated station from uh, it's K0 PRT that was donated by Paul. And it is full remote control over the internet, all HF and six meter bands, all mode, all full power, SDR enabled, and software automation of the equipment and the logging. You can see all the screens here and uh, all the equipment under the bench there. All this will be put in a rack in the new building. Right now it's in the bunker. And these are the antennas uh, that are currently supporting. There's a tri-band uh, 10, 15, 20 meter Yagi on a 50 foot tower, a five band trap vertical uh, out there in the, in the weeds and uh, dipoles for 80 and 160 meters and a six element Yagi for six meters and VHF vertical on a 50 foot tower for two meters. I think we've taken that VHF vertical down uh, it's not currently up there, uh, but we plan to put it back up on the new building. And that's mostly for our talk-in system. Uh, the roads out there can be treacherous. We can break down. We've had a lot of flat tires and runoffs the road. And uh, so it would be nice to have a talk-in radio so if somebody's still on site, we can have them come rescue us. These are uh, some of the screens for... Um, the remote radio station that takes uh, eight screens to run the system or eight windows to run the system. We do that in two screens and two monitors and uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty elaborate system. Any questions about the radio system? Okay, I'll move on. Okay, the, uh, when you do the dish, you have to have RF feed antennas that feed the dish. So we've got uh, like at 1296, we've got um, 42 and a half dB of gain, but we have to get that that energy into the dish in an efficient way and get it out of the dish in an efficient way. So uh, what we have are these uh, these feed antennas that are basically uh, a chaparral type uh, uh, choke ring antennas. Uh, this one has a square resonant cavity for uh, 1420 megahertz and uh, the other one down here on the bench is for 1296 and it has a round cavity uh ray uberek and i call him dr radio he came up with uh, most of these antennas for the dish feeds um the one for four, 408 megahertz and 435 is um these little dipoles out under this structure the structure isn't the dipoles. The, the actual two dipoles are out in front of it, and that structure is to have a uh, a screen a backscatter um, ground plane to prevent uh, picking up from the back side for uh, 408 megahertz. But uh, Ray has devised all these antennas. These are often built out of interesting materials. The one on the table there is a is a massive dog dish. <laughs> 
for either a dog dish or a cattle dish. The one uh, up here on the 1420 is a cake pan, and that's the uh, the ring there. But by by doing these rings, we're able to get the energy into the dish without a lot of spillover and out of the dish without a lot of spillover. So we don't pick up ground noise and um, the the thermal noise off the ground. And so that helps with uh, reducing the noise and increasing our signal noise ratio. So this is the uh, dish tracking. I'm going to share a different screen here. And I hope this works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Let me play this, and this will give you an idea of how we can track. This is actually tracking pulsars on a foggy morning. And you'll see the fog lift, the uh, pulsars coming. Okay. Yeah, I hope you uh, enjoyed that. That's um, That video was done by uh, Mark uh, Slovan, who's one of our members. He uh, actually uh, was a mechanic, and he joined our group. And by joining our group, he parlayed that into a job with Dish Network up in uh, Wyoming. And so uh, he's uh, managed to figure out a way to uh, to do some actual job searching with his videos. He has a, a website called Road, Road Trip Ventures on YouTube and does a lot of these uh, time-lapse videos. So let me go back to the presentation here real quick. Okay. This is, um, let's see if I can do this. Okay, here's what it takes to change out the feed. Um, are you seeing the dish here with Ray crawling up there? Yep. Okay. Uh, Ray's going to strap in right here. He's got a climbing harness on, and there's turnbuckles up there on the uh, feed. If he were to fall, that strap would uh, he just dangle there, and the dish would hold him. It's strong enough that it wouldn't even deflect as it carries his weight. Um, but there you can see that uh, where he's up on a 30, 35-foot-tall scaffolding. And uh, falling is not what you want to do, but that's how we uh, get up there to change out the feed in the front of this, uh, this uh, I call it a donut or a, uh, a tube that's up there. And uh, there you can see what he's doing. This is prior to the building being built. When this pans out, you can kind of see the rest of the site. Um, I might have missed it, but the, uh, the site has the communication trailer. Uh, just where this is pointed off to the uh, north, 
is where the building is located. And uh, that's what it takes to get up there and change that out. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit on this. And here you can kind of see the site. Uh, there's a generator shack. Go out a little further. As we come out further, you see the generator shack. And off in the distance, you can see the, uh, the bunker. But uh, that's what it takes. Okay. So for uh, radio astronomy, uh, we have the high gain 60 foot dish. Uh, we can do hydrogen line, which is at 1.42 gigahertz. Um, it's density mapping of the cosmos. We can do radio Joe, 15 megahertz to 22 megahertz, which is the natural radio signals from Jupiter and the, its moon Io and their interaction. We can do super SIDS, which is from three to 30 kilohertz, which is sudden ionospheric disturbance. And that shows us uh, solar flares and events that change the ionosphere. Uh, we can do meteor scatter from 30 to 100 megahertz. And we do SETI at uh, 1.42 gigahertz, search for extra thresholds at the, at the watering hole. And then uh, we we prove that this is possible with geographically space synchron synchronized signal detection with the Green Bank Observatory and and Hasfeld Observatory and now a new uh, New Hampshire Observatory. So uh, what we I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, with radio astronomy, the atmosphere is um, it's uh, opaque to to some signals, but it's transparent for other signals. So from about five megahertz to 30 gigahertz, it's transparent. So anything in that zone, we can uh, we can receive pretty unimpeded. Uh, for some of the other frequencies, uh, we're blocked by the atmosphere and the uh, ionosphere. Um, here's the uh, Skip. This is Skip Creeley, the guy that gave us the, uh, the power uh, donation. Uh, he did this experiment with one of the uh, radio telescopes at Green Bank. It's a telescope about the same size as ours. And we both pointed to the same object um, in the same part of the sky at the same time and recorded our signal. Um, and what we got were, and then he married those two, two recordings in his uh, computer. And what we got was we saw the object cross over the, the um, two telescopes at the same moment with about the same amplitude. I can't explain the difference in the baseline amplitude here on one side versus the other, but uh, I think that's that's the noise uh, difference between the two things. Actually, this is time on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. So uh, I can't quite explain why there's a difference here in the... Uh, blue and red signals, but uh, he actually did this experiment. And what that tells us is that with two radio telescopes, if we receive a signal at the same moment that's unexpected, this happened to be a, uh, a nebula that we were, we were measuring, but uh, if we received a signal at the same moment with both telescopes separated by 1,200 miles, mm -hmm. that would mean that the, uh, the source of that signal would probably be outside the orbit of Mars. So that would indicate that it's not something terrestrial or even orbital. It's something that uh, is out there a ways. And uh, so it would either be a deep space probe or extraterrestrials. So far, we haven't received any extraterrestrials. To do a uh, hydrogen line, now, uh, 1420 megahertz is um, the hydrogen uh, line and we have this special radio receiver called a spectrocyber. Now we've kind of replaced that with SDRs because the SDRs are good enough now that we uh, really don't need the spectrocyber. But what this shows you is uh, as an object crosses our uh, our beam width, what we can see is uh, uh, this is uh, frequency on the uh, x-axis and amplitude in volts on the y-axis. And anything that shows on the uh, the left hand side of the zero point here is red shifted, and anything that shows on the on the right hand side is blue shifted. And so, when looking at 
deep space objects, we can tell if something's coming towards us, moving away from us, or part of it rotating like if it's a galaxy. We can see the rotation of the galaxy by seeing that portion of the arms of the galaxy that are rotating towards us and those that are rotating away from us. And so it'll show up as a signature on the spectra cyber um, on this graph. So it only measures about 600 kilohertz either side of the hydrogen frequency, which is uh, 1420.406 megahertz. And uh, so what that does is uh, it gives us a very good indication of what's really going on with an object that we're observing. If you don't know about neutral hydrogen emissions, uh, hydrogen is about the most abundant element in the universe. It counts for about 70% of all the matter in the universe. And um, it's a component of the interstellar medium. Uh, it's in everything. And if uh, we can observe it in the spectral line that I just showed you, uh, and in the Milky Way. So if you looked at it, uh, like this, uh, this sky map here shows the Milky Way in the center going across, and that's the, uh, the emission from hydrogen. What happens when hydrogen falls from a, uh, a uh, high energy state to a low energy state, its electron flips over and a photon is emitted at that 1420.406 uh, megahertz or 21 centimeter signal. And as an individual uh, atom, it, it's a very small signal, of course. We couldn't even measure it. But since everything's made out of hydrogen, there's a lot of hydrogen out there, uh, it all adds up. An individual atom only uh, changes its, uh, its, uh, its jump every 10 million years. So, so in, 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 on average, an atom of hydrogen would... Uh, would change every 10 million, well, would change at 10 million years. But because there's so much of it out there in all different ages, uh, you end up with uh, a lot of signal coming back that we can receive very easily with the big dish. Uh, Richard, uh, Dr. Richard Russell, he actually performed this experiment where he mapped by uh, changing the galactic latitude or changing the elevation of the dish and letting the Earth scan across the across the uh, heavens he was able to over time uh, put all of the data from the spectra cyber into a spreadsheet and he's actually got this map that he made with our telescope that kind of goes back and matches that map right there so the he can actually see the milky way galaxy in radio uh, vision across there um Sometimes we use this uh, observable S7. Uh, I believe that's Sagittarius 7. It's a stable bright hydrogen emitter we use for calibration. And it has a, uh, a unique signature, this uh, triple bump here. And uh, here we used a uh, AirSpy R2 uh, uh, SDR and uh, actually measured that and recorded it and compared it to the uh, the calibrated spectrum from one of the professional radio uh, radio observatories, and you can see that they match up pretty well. And then this is an all sky map looking at the twenty one centimeter, and that's the uh, Milky Way galaxy coming across there. So, any questions about uh, hydrogen emissions? Okay. Um, Pulsars are something else we can do. We uh, can receive pulsars. Uh, they're spinning neutron stars with massive magnetic fields. They generate sweeping beams of broadband radio emissions. With our equipment, we, can, uh, act, we can't actually hear them, but we can detect them below the noise floor. And I'll show you how we do that in a minute. Uh, they're comprised mostly of, uh, of uh, neutrinos and have a diameter of only about 12 miles. So a typical pulsar is from about 6 to 12 miles in diameter. And um, they have a mass in a range of 1.18 to 1.97, so about 1.2 to 2 times the mass of our sun. And they're contained in, in a space only of 6 to, eight to 12 miles in diameter. And so that gives you an idea how dense these things are. Here's an example of uh, how we detect them. Uh, the pulsar looks like this. It's a spinning neutron star. 
Uh, it has these jets of uh, high frequency uh, emissions or broadband emissions. And uh, when that when that beam from the spinning pulsar crosses us, uh, we can detect it. And so we get it into the dish, we amplify it, uh, we control the dish to track the pulsar, and uh, we do data analysis on it, and we figure out and we'll end up with a, a signal that might look something like that. So with digital signal processing or folding, we can figure out uh, the pulsar out of the noise. And so we don't actually detect brand new pulsars this way, but if we know of the pulsar, like the ones in a catalog, and there's, there's thousands of them, we can uh, pick out uh, one out of the catalog, uh, point to its location, receive the signal, record the signal, and then fold it based on the, on the known period of the pulsar and uh, fold that up like a piece of paper here. And if you were able to look through it uh, and subtract out all the things that were different and add all the things that were the same, you'd end up with the pulse. This is an example. I'll play this for you. Hey, we got it. You got it? Where? Look, right there. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Yay! <laughs> this is uh, B1508 plus 55. New Pulsar. Yep. September 12th, 2020. Deep Space Exploration Society, Plushner Radio Telescope. Excellent. Way to go. This is number nine. Okay, I, I actually uh, lied a little bit there. We, we don't, I said new, a new pulsar, new to us. <laughs> we've actually detected, I think we're up to 22 or 23 pulsars that we've det detected, which ranks us as like number fourth or fifth in the world of amateur groups that detect pulsars. And so we're still working on this uh, as we detect more uh, we hope to move up that ladder and eventually uh, be number one or two. Actually, the guys in Germany, I think, are number one. They've got a bigger dish and a lot more time on the dish to do this work. And so it's doubtful that we ever pass them, but uh, we have the capability that we could if we had enough uh, sight time. Uh, incidentally, these are different um, pictures of different pulsars. The pulsar name is this B.O. 329 plus 54 that's the strongest one right there it has a uh, seven about a 720 mega uh, millisecond period uh, each one of these pulsars has a different period and that's really important because if you know it's period you can do the stacking algorithm and for amateur radio we can do tropospheric scatter like i talked about before uh, eme moon bounce at 1296 uh, HF radio, VHF radio, UHF radio, microwave radio. Uh, and we, we do do some tropospheric uh, communications. We just did one uh, about a month ago with Texas, and that worked out pretty well. So we do uh, EME, and, and we participate in the contest, most of the EME contests. Uh, we were fourth place in uh, 2020. Uh, for multi-operator, all-mode, uh, 1.2 gigahertz. I think we had about 85 contacts in that one. And we were second place in May uh, of 2023 in DBUS, uh, which is the European, uh, I believe, the European uh, contest. And so um, we're uh, one of the few stations that can do not only all the digital modes for, for EME, and the CW modes, but we can also do single sideband, and not too many of the uh, stations out there can do single sideband. We usually have about, in any one contest, we might have uh, two to four single sideband contacts. I don't know if you can hear this. this is, uh, we tried this before, and it was a little light, but uh, this is my granddaughter. Uh, when we had the, the open house, we did it during the EME uh, during an EME uh, transit uh, last, when was it, last September, and my granddaughter came out, as well as many other people, we, uh, anybody that wanted to, 
bounce her signal off the moon. So here she is. You might not have been able to hear her, but you could probably hear the echo. And so that shows you how long it takes for the signal to get to the moon and bounce back. And so it's about two and a half seconds round trip. I got another one here from, I don't know if I can play this or not. Let's try this. You might have to stop it. Let's see. Huh. Mm. I'm going to have to jump out. Let me, uh, let me play this one by Gary. I'm going to only play the first and the last half of this, but uh, Gary made a contact here. Whiskey 6, Yankee X-Ray. Whiskey 6, Yankee X-Ray. Kilowatt 0, Papa, Radio Tango. Kilo 0, Papa, Radio Tango. I'm going to jump to the end. Yeah, thank you very much for the call. A whiskey 6 Yankee X-ray, kilowatt zero Papa, radio tango 73, Jim. <laughs> Stanford University. So there you see uh, emitted contact. Actually, I, I said the wrong thing here. We were only putting out about 180 watts when we did this, and they were about 200 watts. Um, or actually, we were 200 watts into a 60-foot dish, and they were 400 watts into a 30-foot dish. And uh, that was the Stanford Radio Observatory uh, out in California. So uh, that kind of shows you what we can do. So that brings us to uh, education and outreach. Uh, so every year we have an annual open house. Uh, tentatively this year, I, I'm pretty sure we've locked this down, October 5th, which will have a full moon transit during the day. So we'll be able to do EME all day long on October 5th. Uh, we, we have optical and radio observatory demonstrations, uh, judging of, uh, we do judging of awards for uh, the Pikes Peak uh, Regional Science Fair and Technology Fairs. Uh, we have publications on radio and radio astronomy that we try to get uh, out into the, some of the, uh, the uh, annals. Uh, we have um, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers that we participate in, site trips and tours to national radio observatories. Uh, we have a website with all our proceedings and articles open to the public at dses.science. We have member mentorship of student participants and presentations to amateur radio and other civic clubs. Uh, last year, we did an open house barbecue, uh, lunch and classroom seminars. And uh, these are this was in the new building before we had the interior finished. But uh, we hope to that'll be a little nicer this year with the uh, with the walls all up and everything ready to go and with the full kitchen. Some pictures of the past uh, open houses. Uh, we used to do a uh, pancake, pancake breakfast uh, on Sunday mornings if people stuck around. Some people like to come out and camp out with our campers and uh, hang out with us. So uh, usually we're uh, we're there on Sunday morning and we pack up by about Sunday noon and go home, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great time out. So if you have a chance, come on down and, uh, and join us. In education, uh, we do the, uh, like I said, the Peaks, Pikes Peak Regional Science Fair. This is a young gentleman, Xander Duvall. He actually took our uh, our data on neutral hydrogen and presented a science fair project on it and took uh, the data and analyzed it and did a whole bunch of research and uh, placed in the uh, regional fair and then went to state and did really well at the state fair. Uh, in 2019, we had uh, Hans uh, Gainsborough who um, did a, uh, a special SDR for radio astronomy and presented it at the Sarah Western Conference with about 200 of our Sarah members 
and got a standing ovation from all the senior Sarah. Uh, Sarah is the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers. And these guys traveled all over the world doing uh, conferences, and uh, they gave him a standing ovation for his work on SDRs. And then Dr. Richard Russell uh, usually sets up a uh, pretty good radio astronomy demonstration educational program. And we had a certification program, but uh, we had so few people want to participate in that that we've kind of dropped it, but we may pick that up again. So for public outreach, we do annual community events in the area. The area is a, a very rural and farm and ranch based area. And so Gary and I have been going out to the Eats Bazaar and the Haswell Bazaar. Oh, sorry. And, and we do uh, a lot of uh, community contacts or meet a lot of communities uh, contacts. And we make our operations known so people don't uh, have suspicions of what we're doing out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so that's one of the things we do with our open house and we do at all these uh, community events. And then, like I say, we uh, participate in the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers and do it's a good outlet for uh, some of our members to write papers and give presentations and get recognition for the work that they do. We have meetings. Uh, we have an engineering and operations meeting every second Monday of the month at 630 Mountain Time. And we have a science meeting every fourth Monday of the month at 630 Mountain Time. And our, we have a site work trip standing schedule every third Saturday. And but you need to contact a board member for the schedule on uh, whether we're going on that on that third Saturday. And um, you can join DSAS for $50 a year full voting membership. And you can join on PayPal at our website. Uh, there's a, a sign up page and a PayPal. Uh, 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 join site there or, or membership site there. So that's all I have. Uh, for more information, you can uh, just type in dses.science into your browser, and everything we do is usually published on that on that website, and it's got all the archives of everything we've been doing, at least since I've been secretary or was secretary. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of information out there and a lot of paper. So that's about it. Any uh, questions on all of that? Hey, great job, uh, Bill. It yeah. was really, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> I've been a member now for about two and a half years. So uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of stuff I didn't realize we actually did. So you, you really did a good job covering it all. Well, thanks. Yeah, when are you coming down, Peter? Uh, <laughs> I wish I could. Um... It's been uh, it's it's been interesting, Bill. Thank you very much for for this. Uh, it's it's good to get a, a lot more in depth view of what you guys are actually doing down there, and uh, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. You're very fortunate to have something that uh, you don't have to share with anybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I I kind of look at it this way. It's like uh, well, two two things. One is when you were a kid, right? You always wanted a compound, <laughs> right? You know, when you when you played Fort and you did all those things, right? You always dreamt about having this high tech compound. Like, uh, oh, who was the who was the uh, one that was on the Saturday morning uh, programs? You know, and now we've got one. <laughs> yeah. No, so we've got that. And the other thing is, where else would you get to play with something this of this magnitude? I mean, you couldn't build this thing for six and a half million dollars, you know. So uh, it's uh, quite exciting to uh, to be able to get to enjoy something of that magnitude with a, a bunch of people with like minded uh, experience. I know exactly how you feel. Um, I don't know whether you're aware or not, but uh, I was involved with the uh, VE three ONT operation back in the '90s at uh, Algonquin Park with the 150 foot dish. Oh yeah, that's a big yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, it was a big deal, and uh, still uh, probably the highlight of my amateur radio life. Um, it was uh, it was quite amazing. There were a lot of disappointments though too. Um, in on that regard, you mentioned that uh, are you planning ten gigahertz operation with the sixty footer? Well, we're going to go up in frequency as we get more uh, more capability in microwave. Um, we'll probably do. 
right now we can go up to um let's see we've got some four point what are they four point eight gigahertz uh receivers that are commercial receivers and and feeds and we, so we can do things like uh, track satellites and such with those um it'd be real interesting to look at uh some of the satellite feeds you know commercial satellite feeds with our 60 foot just to see what kind of gain we get out of this uh so there's that and uh but we'll probably do the two uh We'll probably do the two gigahertz in the two gigahertz range, two point five gigahertz, yeah. and then go up from there. Yeah. But um, Alex yeah. is working on a twenty three hundred four uh, yeah. transverter for the uh, for the dish. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no question you'll you'd be pretty successful with the uh, you, you know a two point four gigs, um, maybe even three and a half as well. Um, 10 gigahertz, uh, we tried that. Unfortunately, I was not there. It was the only operation at Algonquin we did over the four years that I, yeah. was, not, not, I was unable to attend due to a family event. Um, but um, it was a huge disappointment. Um, there comes a point where the dish gets too big for moon bounce um, as you mm -hmm. go up in frequency. And it would seem that for 10 gigahertz, something in the order of seven or eight meters might be the uh, the peak size. So you might actually be better off with the 30 footer that you've just acquired for 10 gigs than you will with the 60 footer. So uh, um, just keep that in mind. I mean, it's worth a try. Um, yeah. So the surface of the dish might be still fine at 10 gigahertz. I'm not sure about that, but um, it's just you start under illuminating the moon, you start getting a lot of weird reflections coming back because you're hitting all the different little surfaces on the small area of the moon that you're actually hitting. And uh, I guess uh, that the, the uh, returns start diminishing as you go yeah, up. Start, you start seeing uh, interference and scintillation and that sort of thing I, off the moon. Yeah, I, and I'm not the expert by any means, but I know that... Um, uh, K2UIH, the 3 aso Mike Owen, W9IP were all involved in the uh, 10 gigahertz operation. And uh, uh, it was very frustrating. Uh, I mean, they had other issues other than just the lack of signal coming back from the moon. Everybody, I think, was expecting something absolutely tremendous. And uh, because certainly at 1296, which is the highest frequency that I was involved with, I mean, the echoes were S9 coming back with 100 watts at the feet of the dish. And uh, oh, yeah. um, they were just just uh, amazing. Um, anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. The other thing I'll, I'll add, um, our first year up there was, uh, uh, it, it didn't go very well due to some weather-related power issues. Um, it didn't go at all, actually. And uh, But what it did was, was taught us the need for um, quick change capability for feeds if you're going to do multiple bands. And sure. I would, uh, if you, you haven't uh, spent some time trying to make your feed changes uh, efficient, quick, as, as, as few connections as possible, uh, connections that are all the same, all that kind of stuff, um, definitely worth looking at. It'll pay you dividends down the road for sure. So. Uh, yeah, Ray's put some work into that. Originally, he designed a, a four-band antenna that we could switch, and it would change instantly. Mm -hmm. But it had a lot of problems, and uh, most of those things, I think, could have been solved. But um, some other members of the group got frustrated with it and decided to go to single feeds. And so what Ray did was um, he, get, he set up a like a bayonet kind of mounting system where uh, he can change the feed out in about an hour. Yeah, a lot, that's, so, that, that's about what we got to doing. Um, I know Michael and did most of the feed, and I did both, the two of us did most of the feed changes during the 1993 operation, which was the most sex, successful. That was on three bands, uh -huh. uh, uh, 144, 432, and 1296. And uh, um, being able to do the, the uh, feed change uh, on a 150 foot dish in, in an hour uh, made a huge difference. And oh, yeah. so it's definitely worth just incorporating into your designs. So, yeah, in fact, they were uh, Ray and RC went down, I think it was yesterday, and changed the feed. 
and that only took them it didn't even take them an hour they oh, changed perfect. from the uh from the 1296 feed to the 14 uh 20 feed and uh, just two of them and ray did most of the work and it was less than an hour so right. super unfortunately they also went down saturday and forgot to take the antenna with them <laughs> oh, nightmare uh, so they had to come back on my on on monday or tuesday to do it <laughs> oh dear well yeah that kind of thing happens unfortunately i don't know how many trips i've made up a tower only to get up to the top of the tower and find i don't have what i need so that's know, right yeah. for a ranch or something so <laughs> anyway good t good talk and uh um Really good to see you. some of the other things you guys are doing with your outreach programs and everything. I think that's fantastic. And uh, yeah. having having the dish at your disposal 100% of the time, uh, essentially, um, and be able to do what, what you want with it is huge. And uh, you're able yeah. to do that thing and uh, well worth doing, too. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. so, well, hey, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Peter, I, I, I don't know. You, did you hear about our project for next year? Uh, I may have. Which one are we talking? We're talking about uh, the... Um, um it's uh, earth venus earth oh really okay yep we did, um, we did the uh the, the 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 signal path loss uh, calculations and uh figure with 1500 watts on uh, 1296 uh, and using digital mode 265 uh, we we can uh, we can get the digital communications between us and and back to earth you're going to find a lot of a lot of difficulty finding somebody else that's going to have that capability. Though. So. It's, it's not that hard, actually. The, the um, well, the military, the, the U.S. military, did it years ago. So. Yeah, that that was yeah. They're using megawatts, and there's, there's, a, there's a group in Germany did it in oh, really? uh, 2009. Okay. They but they didn't. All they did was they're just sending pulses back and forth, and they're able to hear the pulse. And back in 2009, we didn't have WSJT. And yeah. we didn't have a lot of other things. So, uh, but they're running 6KW. And, oh. uh, but with, uh, with digital uh, techniques today, we can bring it down right into the noise. Yeah, and, nice. uh, we, and, and Venus has a reflectivity of 0.7. The moon is 0.1 ah. because of the atmosphere. All right. So, well, something well, to talk uh, about in the future. You may want to come on down for that one. Well, I, I someday I hope... To, to make it down there I it, it won't be this year we're this fall it's uh it's all about the microwave update down in Vancouver so I'm involved with that yeah and uh so that, you're in uh, where are you, where are you located Peter I'm I'm right on the U.S border um like I can see it out in, the window behind me here in uh, BC in B in in British Columbia but halfway across the province it's a small town uh called Grand Forks um, yep. like, like North Dakota, uh, two rivers, two bridges and floods. Yeah. Well, my brother is in Sumas, Washington. Oh, yeah. okay. So yeah. he can see the border from his house going the other way. Yeah. But he's, he's right down yeah. uh, opposite, uh, what Abbotsford or something. I'm going like to stop the recording yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So,